Hi, welcome to God's Stories today. My name's Chris Thompson. You guys coming? Hello and welcome to God Stories today. Um, this is my first on location uh, interview, so I'm really excited about that. Please um, give me some slack, bear with me in terms of the lighting and the sound. Um, I'm learning truly as I go. Uh, pray for me in that sort of uh, fashion, um, but what an adventure it is um, to be doing this for the Lord. Today I've got the company of Bishop Chris Goldsmith. Um, he's the Bishop of St Germans. Yeah. Um, and he's got um, some very exciting news to share. It's already out there, but it will be nice to have the uh, in-depth um, sort of take on that. Um, yeah. But before we get into who Bishop Chris is, um, don't forget to check us out on social media, on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And if you want to email me, it is godstoriestoday at gmail.com. Bishop Chris, welcome and thank you for your time. It's You're really kind welcome. of you. It's good to be here, Chris. Bless you. Um, I normally start off with a snapshot uh -huh. of where the interview is at the time sure. right now now I, I, that's quite a big snapshot for yeah. you um so so go for it if you can be as succinct as possible because that's quite a quite a thing in terms of yeah. where you're at sure i'm the bishop of st germans uh which means i'm the assistant bishop in truro diocese down here in cornwall mm -hmm. uh, i've been here just over six years mm -hmm. uh, and just in the last month or so uh, it's become public that i'm actually going to be moving on much to my surprise uh, but also something uh, I'm, I'm really pleased about. Uh, I'm going to become the Director of Ministry for the Church of England. The downside is... Small will... job, small job. <laughs> well, indeed. The, the downside is that it's going to involve leaving Cornwall and the amazing people I've got to meet here yeah. and know. So a little bit mixed feelings at the moment, mm -hmm. but uh, very glad to be here still. And uh, I'll be in, around until the middle of September. I want to offer you a favour. I'm always in London. So do you want me to bring you up some pasties every now and Thank again? Thank you very much. <laughs> that would be a great, uh, a great reminder of uh, past times. So it's exciting times for you now. Yeah. But let's take you back to the beginning. Mm. We want your God story. Sure. Where were you born? Uh, I was actually born in Catford in South London. Get out of here. Yeah. That's right, just along from the Robinson's Jam factory and next to the bus station. I used to go past the bus station all the time on the bus well, as a kid. Yeah, so I'm a South London boy. Oh, you really? I was, indeed. So we stay, uh, that's where I was born, or more accurately, Lewisham General Hospital. Um, but I was brought up in Kent. We moved to Dartford when I was still quite small. Right. So all of my school age was, uh, was in North Kent, in, around Dartford. Um, Happy childhood? Very much so. I'm the eldest of five brothers, oh. so life was busy and great fun. What's not to like? Four, four brothers together. Um, so there was always stuff happening, always friends mm -hmm. around, always football, boots, socks, games, all the rest of it. So what were you like as a kid then? You sang oh. quite outdoorsy? From uh, what you just said yeah, there? I was very much involved with the Scouts, for example. I oh. love uh, walking, orienteering, that kind of thing. I played rugby for my school mm -hmm. and later for my university as well. Um, but I, my real passion at school that emerged was in science. So, I was going to say, what was your favourite subject? Yeah. And I bet it's science. Well, I, science and geography probably, but the, I couldn't combine those two very easily. And so I ended up choosing science, very happy to do that, mm -hmm. and went to university to study biochemistry. Mm -hmm. um, very happy childhood. But Christian faith wasn't really part of it. I was baptised as a baby, mm -hmm. and there was certainly no antagonism toward uh, Christian things. But just no engagement. It just didn't feature in our life, certainly not in my life. I've got one memory actually from school, and I guess what must have been an RE lesson, of somebody talking about the way that um, the death of Jesus Christ on the cross made a difference to our lives now. And I can mm. remember asking, well, how can that be? Mm. And although I can remember the question, I actually can't remember the answer, which is sad, isn't it? Mm. So faith didn't as I say, didn't feature in my life. I'm, I, I am a very curious person, probably in both senses of that word, but I'm, I'm, I like I to find that. out. I didn't say 
<laughs> I do like to find out about things. That's where science attracts me. Mm -hmm. um, but and when I got to university, which was in York, mm -hmm. um, really discovered I loved science. But I also, very early on in my time there, I met some, uh, some other students who were Christians. Mm. And I think, if I'm honest, I'd never really engaged with Christians um, properly before. I'm not sure I'd ever met one. I must have done, <laughs> but I didn't, wasn't aware of it. And it helped that they were both attractive young women as well. So that certainly I'm with was that. <laughs> part of the intrigue and interest. But the thing that really kind of caught my attention was just these were people who really, they just seemed very together. Mm. They seemed very purposeful. They seemed really kind. They seemed really thought through and peaceful and so on. So that, I was intrigued, if I'm honest, mm. about that. So because mm. you've got nothing else to do as a student, spent hours uh, <laughs> chatting to them and, and others that they knew about the Christian faith. And, and I guess that kind of crystallised my understanding of the Christian faith, but perhaps not in the way that they were hoping. Right. Uh, because I think what it really crystallised initially anyway for me was why I'm not a Christian. Talk about Why that it more. Didn't make sense for me, well, especially as a scientist, as a budding scientist. Yeah, and how that... Actually, that wasn't the issue. It was um, no. I've interestingly, as a scientist, I've never had an issue between you know science doesn't science explain everything because I knew it didn't. I mean, the, the more you know about science, the more you realise that it has limitations. Yeah, it's really okay. considering a part of reality, not the whole thing. Science doesn't tell you why you fall in love. Science mm. doesn't tell you about loyalty uh, and, and about uh, beauty and things like that. So I knew there was a, there was more to life than that, uh, but it just kind of it didn't kind of make sense quite for me. I couldn't see how something that had happened such a long time ago would affect me now. But on, on, um, they invited me along to a service in York Minster, which if any of you've been mm. if you've been there, you'll know is a mm. massive building. It was actually an Advent carol service. I didn't know that then. But that's what it was. Uh, the the cathedral was absolutely full. Um, but astonishingly, when I was there, the person speaking in that service, it felt like it was just him and me. Turned out later that it was somebody who's very well known as a Christian speaker at that time, a guy called David Watson, sadly died, but okay. a brilliant evangelist. Uh, um, and what was really, uh, it really got my attention was that uh, not only did it feel like he was just speaking to me in this crowd, but also somebody had given him my list of objections to the Christian faith, <laughs> which he proceeded to kind of work through and demolish and highlight really, do you know what, this isn't, you've not really thought this through, have you, Chris? Can you remember what they were? Uh, those particular objections, um, I think it's mainly this idea that why, how can something in the past affect the present? Right. And um, I guess also the fact that acknowledging that I've done, all of us, including myself, have done wrong, mm. Uh, but I don't just have to live with that. Mm. Actually, that can be put right. Mm. It was that that really caught my attention. And I knew at the end of that, I'd had these reasons why the Christian faith I'd kind of offered as, you know, resistance, as it were, to these Christian friends, why I couldn't join them. But I knew at the end, if I had any integrity, I needed to do something about it because um, I'd realised those objections didn't hold water. Mm. You know, actually the Christian truth not only makes sense but is actually historically um, reliable mm -hmm. you know that the the only real explanation of what happened at Easter is that Jesus was a resurrected astonishing unbelievable but true um, and so I think probably that night in the Minster was the first time that I knowingly prayed really not sure I'd ever done that before so is that um, when faith came alive for you then? well I think so I, I I guess it was certainly the first conscious step at the time, I'm sure I would have said, yeah, this is definitely, this is where it all begins. Before this, there was nothing, and now there's everything. Actually, as I've gone on, I've discovered there were actually some Christians in my family. My grandmother was praying for me. Mm. And I think there were things, as it were, in my background, in my context, that God had used to kind of prepare the ground, shall we say. And I'm more uh, understanding and, and kind of... Uh, well, like every teenager, yeah. you think you think you're the first person to discover everything, <laughs> and I realise now actually that wasn't true, but it's certainly where it began, and it's where it came alive, and it's where it became something I was conscious of. So I joined with other Christians at the university. I'd got no background in church or anything, so I just went with them to mm -hmm. church, 
And it so happened that um, some of them went to a Christian Brethren assembly mm -hmm. in the morning. Uh, so I went along with them. And others went to St. Michael the Belfry, which is a charismatic evangelical church mm -hmm. in the evening. So mm -hmm. I just went along to that as well. I thought that was perfectly normal. And why not? Uh, and as a result, <laughs> I've realised, do you know what? The church is amazing mm. in its diversity. And every part of the church has some part of the truth that it's really got hold of and that you can learn from. You know, so for, from the Brethren, for example, they have a service called the Breaking of Bread every Sunday. So, uh, you know, I'd now use the language of it being Eucharistic. Mm -hmm. That's not language they would have used. But it's a very quiet, almost a Quaker-style service. Mm. Um, then people will introduce a prayer or a Bible reading and so on. Only the men, that was their understanding would be that it was all about the men in terms of leading in worship. But that quietness and that centrality of the breaking of bread, sharing mm. bread and wine, remembering Christ's gift of himself to us, that's really central for me. And, mm -hmm. and it didn't come from the Anglicans, it came from the <laughs> brethren. And then in the evening, uh, it was real uh, enthusiastic um, worship, uh, uh, well, Graham Kendrick was part of the music group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Murray Watts and Paul Burbridge had started riding lights in that church. Graham Cray was the youth leader. David Wor Watson was the, the vicar. And I just thought that was all perfectly normal. <laughs> <laughs> Typical. And I realise now I was incredibly blessed mm -hmm. by being in a place of real creativity, real depth, uh, real, um, yeah, a, a real seriousness about growing in faith. So just naturally stepped into that, became part of that. The small group at the university that I was part of uh, in the Christian Union was really important. And actually, I think as I look back over my whole Christian life, being part of um, small groups is mm. where I've done most of my growing, most of my becoming more of a disciple and so on. It's been in those where you can ask questions, basically. I Wikipedia'd you this morning, right. and I realised that you were called to be a reader to start with. Is that right? Unless the uh, information is wrong. No, no, no. I was absolutely. In fact, I was so a reader about your... for sixteen years. Which, really? And a reader for those that don't know about the Anglican setup. That's a lay preacher, Thank somebody who's real. trained in teaching uh, in church and so on, and, and sharing leadership uh, with others. Uh, yeah. So um, talk about your calling then to, to, to ministry. Yeah. Well, that's interesting because um, I by then I had left university, I was in my first job, which was as a research scientist, back in Kent, actually. Cool job. A place called Sittingbourne. Um, enjoying that. And I was part of the local church. I have, in principle, I think we ought to be part of the church where we are, rather than travelling to somewhere that suits our taste or preference. Anyway, I was there, and uh, there were a lot of good things happening. There were some folk there who were really wanting to grow in their faith, including a guy called Bob, Bob Coles, a good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And he came along to me at one point and said, Chris, I'm... I think I'm going to train to be ordained. And he said, do you want to do it with me? <laughs> and, and I said, uh, actually, Bob, I'm not sure that's what God wants me to do. Because mm. I think maybe God wants me to be a Christian in the workplace. And I'm not sure I feel called to be ordained. But that got me thinking. And, and I discovered that there was this alter option of um, training part-time. It's a bit like me doing an open university course, that kind of thing, distance learning with some group work as well. And so over the course of, uh, I think it was three years, I trained as a reader. And then I was a reader, so helping with leading services, helping with teaching in church. It's good ministry. For 16 years in different churches. And absolutely felt um, it made complete sense to me. So it means I've been preaching for a very long time um, <laughs> and so on. And I have to say, I kind of thought that's how life would be for me. So when did the ordination call come? Well, um, that was actually uh, a little bit later. Um, so my, I, I moved away from science in my work. I started to get tired of test tubes, or perhaps better. I discovered, <laughs> I've never heard that sentence well, before. Well, <laughs> trust me, it can happen. But I started to realise people are much more interesting uh, okay. than stuff. And so I was kind of drawn into working with others. So I, I started to work in what then was called personnel, what now would be called human resources. In, a, in recruitment, in leadership development, in team development and so on. Mm. So actually my interest in how people are, a, how you recognise the gifts of others, how mm -hmm. you help them discover for themselves what they're good at and how you develop that gift in them and then help them to find an outlet for that gift together with others has actually been there for me from very early on. Mm. Anyway, that role, so I then went to an oil refinery in, uh, in Essex where I was 
um, the HR director uh, ah. in, in that role. Uh, and then I went to work in the Netherlands. So we were living in Amsterdam. Really? Yeah, I was, I was the HR cool. director for the offshore oil and gas uh, business in the, Nether- in, in the Dutch part of the North Sea. Exciting. Um, had to learn to speak Dutch. That was really hard. Give us a go. Hard to vind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ik ben. My Nederlands is an entaal rustig just now. It's not so good as it uh, in the Faleda was. Wow, that sounded like you're speaking so in tongues. Words, my Dutch is, is not as good as it used to be. <laughs> All right, okay, um, cool. But anyway, <laughs> I, I know enough Dutch to surprise Dutch people again. That's <laughs> probably the best thing to say. It came time to come back to the UK for yeah. this job. We were there in Amsterdam nearly five years. I'd been involved in the church there as a leader and as a reader and so on, uh, right in the middle of Amsterdam. But as I came to leave, um, somebody said to me, Chris, have you ever thought about being ordained? Now, the reality is I'd been asked that question quite a few times over the years. Mm -hmm. And I'd sort of perfected my response, which was true, which was to say, yes, I have. And I've thought, prayed about it as well. And I believe God wants me to be a Christian in the workplace and, and not to kind of come out of that. But as I went to give that answer, which by then was a very familiar response to this person, the words kind of turned to dust in my mouth and I realised they've been true, mm-hmm. but they're not true anymore. Oh. Just felt that very strongly. Oh, OK, that's a bit disconcerting. <laughs> not sure what that's about. But when I came back to the UK, which was actually to Essex by then, we, that's where we were living. So Chelmsford Diocese. I started exploring there, with, you know, what would it take to be... Mm-hmm ordained and so on and was um, accepted for training mm-hmm. and I trained on um, a course again kind of part-time bit like an open university set up um, for uh, what is now St Melitus College. Oh, right. um, so three years doing that and then in 2000 I was ordained um, into the Church of England still working full-time in my role which by then was a global role so I was traveling all the world doing change management for a major multinational company. I did most of my assignments on aeroplanes or in Mm. airport lounges and so on. Um, But my curacy was in a place called Pitsy, uh, which is basically, well, you know, the not so attractive end of Basildon in Essex. 26,000 people in that parish, a big big setup. But a part of the world where... Well, if people had any get up and go, many of them had got up and gone. Okay. And it was a place that was a bit, you know, had down on its heels and lacking confidence. And so a big part of my role there, it felt, in as, you know, learning the ropes as a, as a new curate, was to help people find hope mm. in the gospel and think that they had something to contribute. So again, it was about looking at gifting and how that can be encouraged and how that can be uh, enabled uh, in others. Um but after two years, then the, the the vicar who was supposed to be training me left, so then I was on my own as a part time <laughs> curate in a big parish. So that was, and somehow or other I survived, and so did they. Um, and I learned to love the people there, and you know we saw God do some great things. But it was really, um, it was a very funny life, and a life which I thought would be an experience I'd never have again, because during the you know, a lot of my job was flying around the world, meeting with people who were amongst the elite in whatever country they were in, because they were working for an organisation that was seen as a great job to get and so on. These were incredibly gifted, talented, confident mm-hmm. people. And then coming back to a parish where people had never really been told or helped to see that they were worth uh, care mm-hmm. and they had something to contribute. They were of value and so on. And, and switching between those two worlds felt really challenging, mm. but also really certainly got me praying. Mm. The thing I hadn't realised is that actually that experience it was going to stand me in good stead later for now as a bishop. Oh, right, yeah. Because one of the things about being a bishop is you meet all sorts of people. I'm sure. So you go from meeting, I don't know, have the Lord Lieutenant, whoever it might be, to meeting some folk in the homeless shelter yeah, yeah. from one hour to the next. And... How can you be yourself, Mm. kind of retain your integrity, and yet treat people where you find them Mm. and help them to find hope and grace and blessing in the gospel? And I realised, well, thank you, Lord. I didn't think I'd need to do that again. I'd really love to know two things. Firstly, Mm. um, you're in parish ministry. You're you're actually a vicar now. You've done your curacy. You're in a vicar. You're in parish ministry. And somehow, 
a phone call comes, an email comes, but contact comes, and it's 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 the journey towards being a bishop. Okay, it's a better story than that, if I can tell it. Cool. Okay. And then I'd love to know, jump in after that, yeah. how this how it came about, the, the journey towards you being now head of Mindiv. Yeah. How did that come about? Okay, I can cover both of them. Um, so I think if I'm honest, I always used to imagine that having a vocation, having a calling, was something you had once in life, and then you followed the so art of that story. That's so in reality, I think calling is much more an ongoing thing. I totally agree. And and so I've discovered I've I've been called many times. Yes, absolutely. Not just once. Mm. So for example, there came a point when initially in my curacy I was carrying on working full time and fitting uh, being a vicar or being a curate in around that, but I felt God say to me, Chris, I want you full time now. Okay. And so I offered that and I became vicar of a couple of parishes in Brentwood in Essex. I was there for a while. I thought I'd stay there till I retired and was really looking forward to that. There was lots to do. We did great things, but there was so much more uh-huh. that we could do. Um, but I, it got to the point where I was qualified for a sabbatical. So uh-huh. every 10 years in the church, when you can have a break of three months to kind of recharge, re- review and uh, yeah listen to God again and as part of that I walked the Camino which is the long distance pilgrimage route across northern Spain 500 miles nice Uh, really great fantastic I love walking and that was really good Donna Birrell would love that (laughs) yeah well Donna Donna, I've done some pilgrimage with Donna as well Um, anyway one of the things the traditions about the Camino is that in the middle there's a cross um, it's actually on the highest point of the whole route and the People are encouraged to bring with them something, perhaps a stone or something like that, from home and lay it at the foot of the cross right. on the, as they walk the Camino. And this, now there's a huge cairn around this cross that's been accumulated uh-huh, by all the uh-huh. different stones. But I, I knew this, so I brought with me a white stone that I picked up on a beach somewhere or other. And I brought it because... If I'm honest, I'd always been intrigued. There's a verse in the second chapter of Revelation. It's part of the letter to the church in Pergamon that talks about Jesus giving a white stone to those who are victorious. And it says, and on this stone is written a new name Mm. that will will be known by the person who receives it. And I've, it's a very mysterious verse. And I've, if I'm honest, I'm not sure I fully Mm. grasp all of it. But what I think it's about is Jesus showing us who we truly are, mm. helping us to understand our deep, the deep reality of who we are, not who others have told us to be or not mm. how life has kind of squeezed us into being, but who we truly are. So as I laid this stone down on the, uh, the cairn at the wall, I remember praying, um, Lord, I don't know who you want me to be. I don't know who you're calling to me to be, but I'm willing. Just that, really. And what happened? And I guess I have to say, be careful what you pray for, because... <laughs> When I got back from this pilgrimage, there was a letter on my doormat um, from the Archbishop of Canterbury. As you do. Saying, <laughs> Chris, we'd like you to consider being a bishop. Crumbs. And I had not thought about that at all. Uh, in fact... What was well, your first reaction then? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> you know, it, well, I guess the very first was check the address. Have they got the wrong address or the name here somehow? It's been some sort of mess up. But no, it was meant for me. And it turns out there'd been people in my diocese, some of my bishops and so on, who'd been kind of putting my name on lists and things that I was unaware of. Anyway, there you go. Um, And my first thought was, I don't really want to leave. I want to be a vicar. I, I'm really enjoying being a vicar. And this is great. I love the people here. I want this not to stop. This is just distracting. But, you know, when the Archbishop asked you to do something, I, I, so I filled in the form, basically. There's a form, form, isn't there? Okay. There was, yeah. So tell us about yourself. So I did that and sent it off and tried to forget about it and tried to carry on with where I was and what I was doing. Um, but a few months, that was probably in the August or so, and I think it was maybe the November of that year, I got a phone call from the Bishop of Truro, a guy called Tim Thornton mm-hmm. at that time, saying, Chris... Um, we'd like you to come down to Cornwall because there's a job down here as the Bishop of St. Germans and we wonder if this might be right for you. Now, I didn't. I knew Tim a bit because he'd been principal at the, co- the course that I did when oh. I trained, but he'd act- we'd only actually only overlapped for a relatively short time. So I remembered him fondly, actually, thankfully. But again, thought, oh, gosh, 
well, I, you know, I, I haven't got a good enough reason to say no. So I said, OK. And I came down with Ellie, my wife. It was in, uh, in the January, I think. Um, it rained continuously for 36 hours while we were wow. here. So it was like God was saying, don't imagine you're coming for the view. Mm. Um, but we, um, we came and we uh, had the interview. And there just there was a real sense of click uh. with uh, the people, with Tim, and a real sense that actually, yeah, this is where God wants us to be. It's not what we'd looked for. It's not what we'd expected. But this is where we need to be. So when Tim said, the panel and myself would like to offer you this role. How did uh, you feel? I felt, yes. You know, kind of so still a bit in shock because I hadn't, this was not something I'd looked for or planned for. But it felt so right. You know, and I could see, the other thing was about it, you know, rationally. I could see some of the things that they were looking for here, particularly around how you develop ministry, mm -hmm. how you develop teams and so on. This, that stuff I'd done before, mm -hmm. and I could bring something uh, to that. So I said yes. And then they said, there is a, you know, there is just something we ought to tell you. There's not a house. We just sold the bishop's house. Oh, right. <laughs> okay. However, we're thinking about a, a house. And it's that we've, we've wondered, we haven't put an offering yet. We're wondering about doing it. While you're down here, would you like to come and have a look? I said, well, yeah, sure. Come and have a look. And it's this house. It's actually the house we're sitting in uh -huh. today. Um, Great kitchen, by the way. Lovely. Thank you. And it is, it's been a fantastic place. Um, anyway, so we were brought here by the, uh, the Darson surveyor who was about to put an offer in. And I was absolutely astonished when I saw the house because it is a house that I'd seen in a vision what? 15 years before. Oh, whoa. Hold the phone. <laughs> yeah. T go back to the vision then. Yeah, was, sure. was it like, like um, a, a dream? Well, you remember I mentioned about being in Amsterdam and coming back to the UK? Yeah. As part of that, our children were at an age with education and so on, where it was actually a good time for us to move. And we had thought we really wanted to move to uh, southwest London, somewhere like Twickenham uh -huh. or, or that, that sort of, or Teddington maybe, that kind of area. Um, and we kind of convinced ourselves that's what God wanted too, and it wouldn't it be great, and it would have worked really well with the commute and all this kind of thing. But we couldn't sell our house, and we got really frustrated about not being able to make this happen. And we were praying about this, and as we prayed about it, God showed me a, a picture of a house. Um, now, I have to say, I'm not a kind of three visions before breakfast yeah. every day kind of person, <laughs> but just occasionally God shows me a picture of something. It was really clear, and it was the kind of house a child would have drawn. Right. Very symmetrical, a white house with a, a semicircle of trees behind it and a semicircle of grass in front of it. And it felt at the time as though God was saying, Chris, don't worry about the house. So this is where you're going to live. Don't, don't worry, worry about it. No, well, just don't worry about the house. You're okay. kind of all worried about it. So we actually went back to where we'd been before and it was fine. It turned out that that meant we were in Chelmsford Diocese, which was a great place for us to do, right. be for me to do my training and everything. So, you know, thank you, Lord. It was right. But we were, we needed that reassurance. And I kind of thought that was for then and fine. Mm -hmm. Well, that was the house that was 15 years later when I was shown this place. What did you do when you walked up the driveway and you saw it? How did you feel? Uh, uh, very shocked and, and kind of really grateful to God in two senses. Firstly, for the massive reassurance that mm -hmm. that meant, don't worry, Chris, I'm here ahead of you, you know. You're not on your own. Isn't that amazing? So, absolutely. But if I'm honest, I was also pleased that at that moment we had already said yes to the job. And I, why I don't think we worry if I, about if I hadn't, if I'd sort of allowed, if that had been the reason why I said yes, I'd kind of thought, oh, did I really see it? You know, I'd have kind of not quite just trusted myself. So the fact that we'd made the call and then God said, let me just tell you, mm. that's the right call. And I'm here ahead of you. So that was really great. It's cool. meant that this has always been a place where we've known mm. whatever else, it's the right place for us. So what would you say to your successor, whoever he or she may be? <laughs> well, I hope you're as happy and as blessed here in Cornwall as I have been. And what I is hope... God doing in Cornwall? Absolutely amazing. I think one of the things, uh, as you, anyone that comes on holiday here knows, it's a long way from anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, it's also, compared to many dioceses, it's quite small quite a big land area but actually not you know population is not huge um and it's quite rural mm -hmm. i mean the biggest towns in cornwall are only about thirty thousand. you know in anywhere else that's just a smallish 
market town. Here, that's our city, mm -hmm. and so on. Um, so it's it's small scale, and it's off on the edge of the map, as it were. And it's easy to see those things as being a disadvantage, uh -huh. you know. So not so many resources, and you know, disconnect, all that kind of thing. But actually, what I've realised over time is that there's a tremendous freedom in being off the radar, mm -hmm. in being small scale, because if you're bold, you can make things happen in Cornwall. You don't need to get many people around a table like this mm -hmm. in Cornwall to decide to do something. I think it's the most exciting place ever. Yeah. And I'm a Londoner. Yeah. And coming down here, because yeah. I, I thought all energy and all roads lead to London, yeah. and coming down here, it's just like, wow. Yeah. It's true, that phrase, that God is often on the fringes and yeah. the edges making exactly. things happen because there's a permission to do so. And, and there's that tremendous tradition in Cornwall around creativity and innovation, uh -huh. technological innovation. Lots of the stuff around mining was actually invented down here. Banking as well, uh, but also spiritually and the various revivals and so on. Um, so I think one of the things that's interesting, and I, I guess I've been trying to encourage the church here to think of itself not as, as it were, at Land's End, you know, the mm. end of things, but actually the beginning, mm -hmm. and actually to look. Again, when I was praying with a group of other church leaders, we had a phrase that came to us, which was "Look East." Mm -hmm. And if you're in Cornwall and you look east, you're looking at the rest of the country. And there's something about what we do here being a blessing for mm -hmm. others, not just about you know us, but about others too. So having that confidence to try new things mm -hmm. and to be willing to share them. And it's been great, I would say, the innovation, creativity and risk-taking, actually, that I've seen in lots of churches and the diocese here. That's so I wonderful. hope that continues. It's wonderful. And, and God bless the person who does come in yeah, and, and take things to the, the new season. Um, but so you, asked, you, you asked about the... The snap. Wait, this journey. Job. This yeah, is amazing. Well, um, again, um, a, a bit of a theme for me is I think I'm a rather... Um, God's needed to prod me out of... I, I get settled everywhere. <laughs> I, I, know it's very, I know it's very fashionable to be a pioneer. And, and I've certainly done some pioneering stuff while I've been here and actually everywhere I've been. But I think there's quite a lot of me that's a settler okay. rather than a pioneer. Which is a gift, And I so I say. settle, you know, I want to be, see things through and see the people through and so on. So I'd kind of been really looking forward to staying in Cornwall longer uh -huh. until I retire. That would be great. I've really enjoyed working with Tim as bishop and now Bishop Phillips. Fantastic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's lots of new, good stuff that's continuing but also new stuff on the horizon as well so I was kind of you know had my heart set on that if I'm honest uh, and wasn't really thinking of anything else and then I got a letter ah, I got a letter. these letters what yeah, is it? <laughs> exactly well I got a letter this time it was from Martin Seeley who's the bishop uh -huh, of St uh -huh. Edmundsbury in Ipswich but probably more importantly he is the bishop within the whole church of England who has the oversight of ministry right and he wrote to me and he said look Chris we're looking to appoint a new director of ministry mm -hmm. and I've asked around amongst the other bishops and uh, for names of people that might be candidates for that and yours is one of the names that has come up and he, he said to me I, you know this may not fit at all with your planning or whatever which it doesn't actually <laughs> um, he said however if this has and he used a phrase he said if this has any vocational resonance with you good word phrase. give me give me a call and as I read those words vocational resonance I had a vocational <laughs> resident so I kind of felt oh oh that's a that's a call cool. got a surprises and it felt I, I, I mean obviously I, I'll ask him when I get to heaven but I do wonder if that's a bit similar to the feeling that Moses had when he was walking along that path following the sheep through uh, Mount Horeb and so on and out of the corner of his eye he saw something nice. sparkling in a bush nice. and he just looked and was puzzled and it says he turns aside from the path that he was on a path mm. I suspect he knew really yeah, well yeah, I'm sure and and when wandered over to look at this burning bush and as he did it's as he turns aside that God says to him Moses that the call is made clear as he turns aside and I think something similar happened to me so this letter literally out of the blue mm. uh, contrary to what I thought was a good idea and I was looking forward to of staying here, actually has just revealed within me a, a kind of um, an echo of what I think is God's call to me. Chris, I want you to do this. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and I then 
went for an interview. I was going to say, did you have to have an interview? Yeah, absolutely. No, there's a full, you know, proper process about this, thankfully. Um, and if I'm honest, I thought I'd rather mess the interview up. I'm not very good at interviews. And well, you know, forgive me for saying this, but I am quite good at it. <laughs> <laughs> or at least I thought I was. And so, you know, probably overconfident or whatever. I, I don't think I was at my best in that interview. And so I came away thinking, well, two things really. Firstly, oh, it's disappointing that I wasn't, you know, it didn't put myself across in a way I would have hoped to. But also, oh, well, at least I'll be able to stay in Cornwall. You know, mm. that'll be great, won't it? Mm. And then... Ellie and I were out for a walk on our day off. We, there's a lovely wood near Truro. Um, it's in two parts. There's um, Bishop's Wood <laughs> and Lord's Wood that form together some woods called Idlis Woods around here. And we were walking. We were just on the boundary. We were just leaving Bishop's Wood to walk into Lord's Wood. And my mobile phone went off. And it was a message for me to say, Chris, we'd like to offer you the role of director of ministry. How did you feel? How did you feel? <laughs> completely stunned and shocked because I'd kind of talked myself or thought myself into imagining that it wasn't going to happen. Yeah. And then it did. And I knew it was right. You felt that click in your heart. Again. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I knew that that was the right thing. So when did you go? When did you take up the post? Uh, 30th of September. So end of... So not long then. From uh, where very we soon. No, indeed, very soon. So do you have to move to London? Do you have to have to get... I do. It's it's not a quote... It's sort of not a normal clergy job. So there's not a, a house provided. Have you had a vision for the house? Uh, sadly not <laughs> yet. No. But interestingly, I am, I've been praying a lot or reminding myself of that, what I felt God was saying to don't worry about the house. Yeah, yeah. But... It's, I've basically got to find a place from which I can commute into central London, mm -hmm. uh, somewhere in the southeast, and that's difficult. Yeah. Uh, and we're on a short time scale, so, so yeah. it's not finalised yet. No, we're no. at the beginning of August, guys. Yeah, <laughs> it's exactly. time. Okay. There's a place we think might be right, but we'd need to build on it. So we're actually trying to find out could we get planning permission for, to make the change, and if we could, I think we'd go for that. But I'm, as I say, I'm trying to to stay with that. Don't worry about the house, Chris. I need to ask you in the few moments we've got yeah. left, just a few questions about ministry there for, okay. for me. Sure. Um, I used to be an area director of ordinance. Okay. So, so helping people to discern their callings, yeah. as you talked about yourself, is somebody that I have in yeah. my heart as well. Yeah. And equally by being married to the person I am, being in the world of vocations within the Church of England sure. is, is very much yep. up front and central. Yeah. And I think this is a really positive thing in terms of reimagining ministry. In my time as an ADO, and my time now as the other half of, of the person I'm married to, I come across a lot of people who are called to ministry, but look at ministry on the ground and kind of feel like there's a bit of a disconnect in terms of the way they feel right now, what they feel God's calling them to and what they oh. see on the ground. So I think my question is, and I think that's a positive thing, because yeah. it forces a question which mm -hmm. says, well, you know, what about the future? So in terms of um, setting God's people free, yeah. in terms of... Um, reimagining re ministry, what do you think needs to happen within the next 10 years? And that's a big question. Mm. Within the next 10 years, in terms of reimagining ministry mm. uh, for the Church of England to be what the church, what God wants the Church mm. of England to mm. be? Yeah, I, I think there... Um, yeah, there's a, obviously that is a big question. But I, I would say that there are... There are at least three things that uh -huh. are kind of top of my mind anyway, going into this role. Um, the first one, I guess I'd want to say is that Church of England's talked a good game about lay ministry alongside ordained ministry for mm. quite a while. But the reality of where we put our attention and our resources tells a different story, right. which is a big focus on ordained ministry and a rather a neglect, it seems to me, of lay ministry. So I think rebalancing that mm. and actually giving the same degree of attention and, and uh, care about how we encourage and enable and deploy different kinds of lay ministries um, alongside getting continuing to improve in the way that we discern calling to ordain ministry. That's going to be an important part of it. It's going to be more. Um, I would say that another thing is around diversity, uh -huh. that I think there's still rather too much similarity around the kind of people who end up ordained than I would like to see, mm -hmm. both um, ethnically in terms of background, but also in personality and so on. So I think a greater breadth of people in all kinds of ministry, but perhaps particularly in ordained 
ministry. That's going to, and, and partly, perhaps your question in a way is part of the issue, that if there are people who look at what ministry mm-hmm. is like and they think, well, that's not me, then they kind of write themselves out of that story, which may well be what God wants to write them into. So it's interesting because I'm a coach in a church planted and growth centre in mm. London Diocese. Mm. And some of the training we received, um, the, a question was posed to mm. us whereby in terms of the fivefold ministry, mm. we get this right, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. Mm. The person who was giving the lecture suggested that we've been really good as the Church of England in employing pastors and teachers, which is right, good and proper. Mm. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm. But now's the time for apostles, prophets and evangelists. Mm. And there's, I think there's a massive encouragement mm. in terms of re-managing ministry and the embrace of a greater diversity of people and a, gr- a greater diversity Absolutely. of gifts. And it's happening on the ground already. So if you look at what people are actually doing, there is there is a much wider expression of lay ministry and ordained ministry than people might, might imagine. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think a lot of this is about giving dioceses and local churches permission and freedom and encouragement to, uh, to, to have a, a wider expression okay. of ministry. And... It's interesting. I've, I've done some work here with um, some community development groups. It's one of the big things for us. There's a group called Transformation Cornwall here, which does do amazing work, sponsored by the diocese, the Methodist and the Church Urban Fund. And one of the things I've learned from them is something called ABCD, um, Asset-Based Community Development. Glad you said that. And it's interesting because the world I came from when I was working in big business was one where you made a plan you decided who you needed to execute that plan, mm-hmm. and then you went out and found those people, mm-hmm. hired them and made the plan happen. Asset-based community development starts in a different place. It starts with, who have we got? And actually, the who we've got is the first step to discerning what's the plan we need Interesting. to make use of these resources. And it seems to me that's much more true to the, the, what, the what we see from uh, the promises of God to his church, that we will be blessed in every way that we need. The, mm. the church is equipped for all it needs to be and to do. And actually, so one of the, the you know, I, I realise, you know, perhaps without thinking it through, kind of intuitively, when I was a parish priest, I started doing that. So looking at, well, who have we got? Mm-hmm. And what clue does that give us about what it is that God might want us to do? Oh, interesting. Rather than yeah. agonising over, oh, we'd love to do this, but we just haven't got the people. Yeah. Look at who you do have and think, how can we help these people to become more confident in mm-hmm. their gifting, to acknowledge it, to be, to offer that gifting, to, to deepen it and mm-hmm. all the rest of it. So I think there's something there about creativity and mm-hmm. innovation in ministry. And it is already happening. Um, but it's not always acknowledged. Part of the challenge around that this is going to be, for me, as an, in a, soon to be in a national role, is how much of this is for the national church to do mm-hmm. and how much is this f- to happen locally on the ground? Right. Because some, if we try and control, determine, shape everything centrally, it's really hard to be mm. responsive and contextual mm. and creative, as you said before. Things happen on the edge very often. And so it strikes me that we'll need to work out as a national ministry team, where, the, where is our main task to be giving permission mm. and encouragement? And where are the things that we need to ensure, no, there's a common approach, a common standard here? And just really thinking that through very carefully and being cautious about stepping in to try and making it the same everywhere. Mm. Uh, so that would be another thing. And then the third part for me about... Um, that I think is going to be important around ministry. It connects back to this idea that we don't just have one calling. Uh, I and, love that. And by the one way. one initial training, and then you're on your own now. Off you go. But actually, we continue to discover God's call in our life. Mm. It's much more like a pilgrimage, like a journey in which we're accompanied by the Holy Spirit. And that means, if that's if that's a better description of what it means to be a disciple and to be a minister. We're going to need different kinds of support mm-hmm. in that emerging calling at different points in our life. And, and actually, there will never be a point where we don't have anything more to learn. Mm-hmm. And actually, the whole idea of lifelong learning for mm-hmm. those in ministry and, and seeing that not as some kind of remedial class for the people who didn't quite get it the first time or haven't kept up with technology or whatever it may be. No, actually, this is a natural part of being a disciple. We're being called into new things. The world is, is shifting mm. and we, our response and the, how we bring the gospel into those settings will change. 
that means we're going to need new training. So really inculcating in everyone who's a minister, whether they're lay or ordained, you're going to need to keep learning. What do you think the new skills are that we need to learn? I think one of the things is about getting better working with each other. You know, hardly surprising and actually not a new thing particularly. Mm. But actually, we struggle. Mm. I think there's still a lot of heroic individuals in the church. Um, and I think actually that's not ideal. Mm. I mean, thank God for them. And, and many of us have been blessed by them. Perhaps some of us are them as well. But actually, it's working together that's going to make the real difference. Okay. Building community. So those skills of how you create team, create common purpose and so on, I think are really important. I think a lot of this is about recovering confidence as well. Many Christians have lost confidence mm. in their ability to share the faith, to live the faith and so on. So ministry that equips the people of God for the work of ministry. Well, that's, isn't it so exciting that the, the new initiative out of Ministry Division um, under the care of, I think, Dave Mel, to, to have, I think it's by 2025, a thousand evangelists across the Church of England, but their role is to equip, yeah. equip the faithful that are already there. Absolutely. To give them confidence, to yeah. equip them with the correct tools. I think that's so exciting. It is. And, you know, it's, it, is, it is a harder setting in which to be a Christian. You know, you can't presume knowledge or even kind of tacit support from mm. other people. You have to win that by your care, by your way of living. Um, by your uh, integrity and by your faithfulness to Jesus Christ. So there's a, there's a, it seems to me that's the, the real challenge for us, to live out our faith. I think for us in this particular country, uh, we've got a, 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 an especial task for the good of all of showing how we can um, disagree well. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes Christians give examples of how to disagree, but not so good on the doing it well part. Um, but we do. You know, we're all going to be sharing heaven um, and <laughs> learning to live together now is kind of good preparation for that. And I realise it's hard and that whole balance between how truth and unity come together, mm. uh, how you value those two things is, is challenging. But we need to learn to love and care for and respect the people who we don't agree with. I love what you're saying because you also mentioned like hero ministers and so forth, because I'm a great believer that God calls the unlikely. Um, he calls people who, who just feel that they are well, just not worthy, they're not mm. um, educated, they're not equipped, they're mm. not, you know, just no way they could, mm. you know, do anything that, you know, you can yeah. see in the Bible today and yet yeah. actually God's often calling those very people yeah. to do astonishing things because they're likely to people be the people who say yes. And hardly any of those folk will do get there on their own. Good point. You know, just my own story, for example, I'd still be being a working in a big company and being a reader, I imagine, if somebody hadn't talked to me and said, yeah. Chris, how about, have you thought about? And I think, you know, now I'm somebody who should be doing that for others, helping others to see, have you ever thought about this? Or I can see this in you. Have you one, you know, might that be offered in a different way, whatever. And I think it's just making that more normal, more part of who we are, encouraging people, mm. helping them to see what God has made them and mm. gifted them and how those gifts might be used to bless others. That's an important, really important thing. As we're coming to land, um, I have one final serious question. Um, then if it's okay, some quick fire, silly questions, because okay. it's just fun. And then if you're willing, it'll be great if you could pray us out. Yeah, sure. You mentioned that in your curacy, one of your primary roles was to bring hope mm. to places where there wasn't hope. Mm. We've talked about ministry, we've talked about the Church of England mm. in 10 years time, we've talked about reimagining ministry, we've talked about the calling of the unlikely, we've talked about encouraging and equipping mm. people. But within all of that, there was this 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 thing that remained with me that I, I thought, I'm gonna ask you this right at the end. For mm. anyone watching this, um, who perhaps isn't in the Church of England, and for whom all those sorts of conversations about reimagining ministry and stuff. Well, they're not even in the church. They're not even mm. a Christian at the moment. So mm. it's kind of like, mm. well, that's irrelevant to me just yet. It might be sure. if I got into the Church of sure. England. Became that, but right now I'm just sort of like sitting in life and wondering what it's all about. What yeah. would you say to that person who's watching this interview right now? And it could be anyone, I guess, in some sense across the world, mm. ultimately in years mm. to come, if this channel is really blessed by God and who knows what, what would you say to that person who's looking for hope? in their life right now? Mm. It's all about Jesus. And I'll just pick one example of what he's like. 
um, on the day of his resurrection, actually before the news had got out that he returned to life from, uh, from death, um, two of his followers had basically given up, completely shattered by seeing him killed and were going home. They'd given up and they were going home. And he, uh, we're told in, in Luke's Gospel, he gets alongside them and he walks alongside them. They, they don't realise, they're so completely caught up in themselves, they don't realise who he is. Um, and he walks with them as they continue to go in the wrong direction. And he talks to them about what's happening and then he talks to them about how his resurrection has actually always been the thing that would happen, has been there to be understood and was going to be God's way of rescuing, not just them, but everybody. And I think that is such a beautiful mm -hmm. story that Jesus is somebody who loves us enough to walk with us even while we're heading in the wrong direction, to take time to listen to the things that trouble us, the questions that we have, mm -hmm. and to share himself with us. And the hope that we discover in him is the hope of somebody who's seen the very worst that life can bring mm -hmm. and has triumphed over that. Yeah. That, that is somebody I, I want to give my life to. That is somebody worth following. That is somebody who changes everything for me. So that's where my hope comes from. Uh, Jesus and his, his compassion and his understanding of what it's like mm. to be in a mess and to be in a hole yeah. and so on. Yeah. yeah. I think also, if I may say, your testimony, especially about the vision of the house and mm. um, your, your, your God story and how um, God has seemingly always been ahead of you. Uh, preparing yeah. the way yeah. and may that be an encouragement for you as you Thank now you. take on this new season it is. it is that i found incredibly hopeful in terms of hope given yeah. um so so may that be an encouragement yeah. and a blessing to you all now it seems a little bit sort of okay. wrong to go into this section it's called spotlight okay um but it's just a lovely way of sort of like bringing everyone back into um, a different sort of mode of um emotion and um also um it's just just a bit of fun to sort of see uh, another side of you. All oh, right. Okay. Yeah. And they're just silly questions, but at the same time, they're not. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you ready? No pressure. Yeah. Quick fire answers. There's only a few of them. I understand. Okay. Right. Um, what do you do on your day off? Favorite thing? Uh, walk. Bishop's or Lord garden. Wood. Walk or garden. Mm. Uh, the thing you can't live without. Oh. My wife, Ellie. Good. Quite good answer, should I say? Um, film star crush. Could Ooh. be present. Could be when you were a child. Could okay. be a teenager. Um, Cameron Diaz. Good call, good call. Uh, secret pleasure. Um, goggle box. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Favourite serum? Uh, porridge. All oh, right, cool. If you had a superpower, what would it be? Flying. Yeah, I, I said flying. Don Rabiel said flying. We're the only three people who said flying out of all the interviews. Uh, nearly done. Can you reverse park? <laughs> <laughs> I can, but I, I've, I now take the precaution of always trying to get beepers on my car. A good call. <laughs> You're in heaven for the first time. Yeah. Uh, and you meet Jesus for the first time. Oh, yeah. What's the first thing that you'd like to ask him? Um, what's my nickname? The white stone thing. Uh, yeah, but also... I think one of the things I love about Jesus, of which there are many, but oh. what I love the fact he gives his friends nicknames. You know, so Simon, mm -hmm. he says, I'm going to call you Rocky, or Peter, as it is in Latin. Um, uh, James and John, he said, Sons of Thunder. Uh, so I'm, I think Jesus has nicknames for us, friends. and I'm, I'd like to know what his nickname for me is. I'm quite nervous about that. <laughs> <laughs> You're in heaven for the first time, and you meet Jesus for the first time. Yeah. Um, what's the first thing that you'd like him to say to you? Oh, welcome home. Oh, yeah. Again, you're in heaven for the first time. Who's the first family member you'd like to meet? Oh, my father. Oh, really? Yeah, he died the week before I was ordained. Um, he'd come to faith himself. So I mentioned faith wasn't an important thing for our family, but my dad came to faith through a Billy Graham rally uh -huh. in West Ham Stadium. Um and uh, yeah, really grew in, in the latter part of his life. But he died in his 60s from cancer. Oh, right. And um, he didn't quite make it to my ordination. So I would, uh, and I, I know he would be incredibly proud of what God has done with mm. me. So I'd love to see him, yeah. That's wonderful. Last question. Um, you're in heaven for the first time uh -huh. and you can throw a dinner party. 
Oh, yeah. Right, there's five or six seats around the table. Mm -hmm. uh, who would you invite? Biblical characters. Biblical characters, okay. Um, Moses. Peter. And Hannah. You got two more. Oh, two more, okay. Um, Jeremiah. Oh, yeah. Much maligned, I think. I'd like to, yeah. Um, Mark. Mark. No one said Mark yet. That's great. I love that. Thank you for that. And I'd like, because I'd like to hear his side of the story about why he fell out with Paul. Cool. Very good. That would be quite a dinner party. Mm. If I could be a fly on the wall for that one, that'd be great. Bishop Chris, you've been absolutely brilliant. This has been gold dust. Thank you. Um, during a very, very busy time, you know, you've yeah. given up your time for, for this interview. So I can't thank mm. you enough. Um, and I hope it blesses so, so many yeah, people out me there. Me too. Um, would well, you I've like... enjoyed sharing these thank things. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Would you like to pray us out? Yeah, I'd love to. Thank you. Well, Lord Jesus, I thank you for, for all the good you bring into our lives. Forgive us that sometimes we don't notice or we're ungrateful. But thank you. Thank you for the joy that you bring. Thank you for the comfort you bring. Thank you for your patience with us. And I pray for every one of us that we'll keep listening mm -hmm. and we'll keep looking out of the corner of our eyes for your surprising call in a new direction. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bishop Chris. Thank you. God does. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs>